let's start. Um, okay, first thing, uh, who am I and why I'm talking to you? I work for Invica. I'm a technical team lead at Invica. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as a Super Marek. Uh, I usually do basically on almost every single project I do something different. And at some point in my life I did Drupal project, uh, although I'm a symphony guy. So that you may find it interesting. Uh, the title of my presentation, presentation says that it's going to be domain-driven design with uh, Drupal. Um, I'm going to show you, David mentioned that uh, if you were on his presentation that uh, writing unit tests is expensive and you don't really have time for it. I can show you a, an easy trick, I hope, in this presentation. I'll show you an easy trick that if you really want to write unit tests and you want to write tests before you write code, it's very easy and it doesn't matter whether you're using Drupal 8, Drupal 7 or any other framework. Uh, the principle is always the same. I said I work, I'm working at Invica. Invica is a, uh, is a group of companies, a uh, session which mainly deals with Magento, Icos which deals with Drupal, and Sensio Labs which uh, used to be part of Invica, no longer is part of Invica, uh, is, uh, it was dealing with Symfony application, uh, with Symfony. I used to be employed uh, at Invica through Sensio Labs UK. So, a little bit of a background of, of the project we've done, uh, which I want to share my experience with you. So, we had a long-lasting customer, business-to-business -business customer, who is, was using a certain product. Do you recognize this logo? It's Magento. No one likes Magento, especially developers who have to work with it. So, the customer had a really old build of Magento, and because they were like a business-to-business -business customer, a business-to-business -business, uh, type of client, they didn't really care about how they present content to, to, to their customers. They're business customers, so they don't need a fancy CMS or anything like that. So they stick to Magento for that purpose. Magento is an amazing e-commerce platform. Uh, it sells really well because they kind of have this awesome product which is called Enterprise, Magento Enterprise. And for some reason, some people, if they sit in really high, they decide to buy stuff which has an enterprise in the name instead of just going for open source. Um, I'm quite glad that governments are now uh, going more open source than they used to. So, yeah, as I said, developers hate it. So, they came to us and they said that they want to have a, um, a CMS um, which would have all the awesome features, all uh, CMSs out there they have, which Magento doesn't. Um, they wanted to manage the brand website, but they also thought that maybe creating like a temporary website, microsites, let's say, for Christmas, if they have a new range product of products just for Christmas, just for um, uh, different occasions, maybe that would be a way, you know, to get to reach out to customers, their own customers. So they wanted to, they, they already have like a, a separate website just for wines, to sell wines, up to upsell them through like a different macro site, but the same, cha basically same channel. But, as it always happened, they want all the features, but they have no money for that. Very limited budget. So, what we decided to do is our recommendation was that Drupal. And even though we never actually did a project with Drupal before, uh, when, when that happened, that happened a year and a half ago, we decided to go for it. Drupal, because it's open source, it's, there's plenty of people, there's a huge community around there. Uh, mm -hmm. You can, if it, even if you, if you don't want to work with us anymore, you can get someone else. That was our reasoning. They were not easy customer to work with. There is plenty of modules available on the net, which you can just install in Drupal. 
Uh, it's easy to create a multi-site. It's easy to add microsites. It's just, you know, all of it. Um, and it had all the features they wanted. The only problem was that back then Drupal 8 was not ready yet, so we had to go with Drupal 7. And we wanted to write the code the way we like to write, which is we didn't really want to write a crappy old code which Drupal 7 has. Um, we, all, we all know that it does. So we had a choice how to merge those two things together. The easiest solution was to just get some Symfony components, build an API between them or something. Uh, the thing which we wanted to have in the initial release was that uh, we wanted to have all products uh, the Magento shop had in Drupal. But we didn't want to have them like dynamically being loaded from Magento, because as it was an old build of Magento, it was quite slow. So it was kind of, um, uh, it would put a pressure if someone started to look at those uh, new websites and you know, too many API calls. So it could basically put too much pressure. And the customer didn't really want to spend money on upgrading Magento to the latest version or to improve anything on the Magento site. We also wanted to show like a little mini basket, what you have right now in your basket. And um, uh, uh, like a little uh, module, which would allow you to locate your nearest depot. Remember, it was business to business, uh, so the country is divided into uh, regions, and each uh, customer can only order from one place. Prices were different as well, so it was a bit tricky. So, Symfony, powerful framework. It comes pre-configured with everything, but we didn't need Twig, we didn't need Doctrine, we thought we didn't need. So, Symfony is also a really powerful set of, and actually Symfony is a powerful set of components, like decoupled components you can use the way you want. You can build your own framework with it. You can build your sim small applications with it. It's really powerful. They're really easy to reuse uh, whenever you want and however you want. Framework is actually just an addition to that. So we've used Symfony, uh, some Symfony components. I'm going to go through them a bit later. Uh, that allowed us to have uh, something which talks to Drupal and to Magento. Uh, we use comp uh, Composer to, uh, to, to handle that. Um, I know that in Drupal 8, Composer is a standard way to handle packages. So some, anything we are not um, familiar with. OK, domain-driven design. It's a huge topic. Probably I could talk for a couple of weeks about it, uh, and someone would say that I'm talking rubbish and it's not enough, and you could talk more. So I'm just going to talk about one single aspect and how it translates to our code. I'm not going to talk about testing, but uh, you'll see that if you follow this approach, testing and unit testing at the code level is very, very simple. So. Domain-driven design, as name suggests, is design of your code application, what you're building, driven by, by the domain. What well, is a domain? Your domain is what you're doing, right? So, as Eric Evans said, in order to create a good software, you need to know what the software is about. So basically, you need to learn what you're going to do what you're going to build. That's an obvious thing. But how do we learn in the way that we can translate everything from, uh, uh, from, from the domain, from the, basically the idea of the business, to the code level? So the best way is to talk to your stakeholder, people who care about the business, it can be a CEO of the small company. 
It may be a, someone who's dedicated from the company to talk to you, like a product owner. Uh, it shouldn't be a project manager. If you have in your team a project manager who pretends to be a person I know everything, and then, and then tells you, no, you don't need to talk to your customer, that's a, uh, that's a worrying sign that that person doesn't really want you to talk to the customers. You may not really, is an is a un unnecessary uh, communication chain added to your, uh, to your, uh, to your project. Um, sometimes you have project owners who don't really care about what you're doing. I've been in this situation. So that's not a real stakeholder and it's not a person who you would like to talk about. You know, sometimes you work with the customer and you have someone from the customer dedicated, delegated to work with you and they like, yeah, whatever you do, whatever you want. People who, so you need to try to identify who you really want to talk to and try to find people who actually care about the project. Once I had this, uh, this presentation, someone asked, so how do you get those people in? Just invite them. Go and speak. If, you, if someone makes an uh, is an obstacle and doesn't want to invite, just go and invite them. It's, it might be much easier than you think. Don't be, just suggest, you, you know, you can, you can meet your customer in the kitchen uh, and, you know, start talking to them and suggest, or maybe you would like to join our example workshop, or maybe you would like to join in sprint planning. And sometimes, quite often, they, they want to do that. So, once you have your stakeholders, ask them to describe what they want to do with stories. So, this is the, uh, where the gherkin, which David uh, mentioned earlier, comes into place, where you can des describe stories as a simple examples. It's like, given that some acceptance are, are uh, in place, uh, given that some uh, something is in place, when I do something, then something happens, or I can check it. So your examples basically be they become kind of like your acceptance criteria. If you use to tools like Behat, that can be used to automate testing of your domain, of your front end if you want, although I don't recommend using Behat as a browser automation tool. So once you write your stories, then there is a language which emerges from, the, from those stories. You start calling things the same way between, uh, between yourself and between developers, project managers, project owners, and customers. And it makes sense to create those that as a, basically a simple wiki page with a vocabulary, what means what. It might happen that it, it happened for me in the past that developers were talking about um, about the same thing as uh, product owners by using different words. So that's the, the common language. We call it ubiquitous language. And that's a, like a foundation of uh, domain-driven design from like a, uh, running a project perspective, I would say. So having the same language to talk to everyone, it's basically easiest translation, no translation cost between, between parts of, part of the flow, part of the business. There is no surprise in communication. Uh, it, it makes it easy to talk between you and, and your business uh, and, and your customers. Uh, so basically you have those people around on your project, and it's like domain expert, analysis, tester, developer, developer, they all talk, they all understand each other without translation. And then you can have your application code, acceptance criteria, and specification and documentation using exactly the same language. So if your acceptance criteria are written as a Gherkin scenario, sorry, examples, uh, then your product owner can read them as well. And the best way to create them is if you have those three amigos, you have a product owner, you have a developer and a tester, all sitting and writing them together. 
at the example workshop or ahead of example workshop. Then you use just example workshop to validate them. So you would probably ask, can I have an example? So this is our live example. In order to see current uh, correct prices as a visitor, I need to be able to locate the nearest dep depot. And our Gherkin scenario is given I am visiting a product page for the first time, and I got prompted to locate my nearest depot. When I enter my postcode, then I should see my local depot information. So first two lines given and are like what needs to happen for this story to happen. So I need to be visiting the, this particular page for the first time, and I, I should be prom I, I was already prompted to enter uh, my postcode. So when I do it, then I should see depot information. So from here, I can see a couple of keywords which I'm going to use in my code. So instead of calling something, uh, let's say, uh, depot repository, I'll probably call it depot locator. Uh, instead of calling a user user, I'm, calling, I'm going to call him visitor. So these little hints give you idea how to uh, name your code. So when you talk about code, your product owner can understand it as well. Yeah, and this is example of creating a, uh, an interface which uses uh, basically domain, domain language. Some people like to add like uh, interface depot locator interface or create like a long name service manager, uh, provider interface something. I don't like it. I like clean, quick, uh, short names. This, uh, this uh, interface just one, has one method. The smaller interfaces are the better. So the implementation probably was, would be something like that. Magento Depot Locator implements Depot Locator and calls some kind of like API adapter which, uh, which just uh, finds it by postcode. So why using interfaces? In object-oriented programming, interfaces are used to describe communication between objects. So instead of like Let's say you're building a small module. Instead of like guessing, hmm, but I would use some like repository, Symfony repository, so you know what methods it, it has. But then someone comes in and say, oh, I would like to use your uh, code with uh, Mongo. And then suddenly your code is not compatible with it because it directly, you directly reference the doctrine. So instead of referencing an object from outside of your domain, uh, you create an interface and you hide something behind that interface. So if you have a doctrine you may which uses uh, database, you may want to switch to uh, Magento, uh, sorry, Mongo, or you want to switch to Elasticsearch, it's easy because it's hidden by, behind, your, behind that interface and that interface is a boundary which tells the outside world how you want to communicate with it. Yeah, it's called layer architecture, uh, as Uncle Bob says, higher level module should not depend on a lower level implementation. So basically your domain code should not know how you're going to persist, uh, how you're going to persist the data. It knows how it wants to fetch it from somewhere, but it doesn't know the details of it. It doesn't know whether it's a SOAP API or is it a RESTful API, or maybe it's just like a something called API, but from your domain perspective, it doesn't really matter. So it's called dependency inversion as well. You have a policy layer which tells how it wants to interfere with, uh, with uh, some other mechanism, and it basically creates an interface which is implemented by a mechanism layer, which may want to talk to the utility layer, but through interface as well clear separation between, between layers. Yeah, so from your perspective, from the application perspective, you, you always um, kind of talk down. 
So your application should not know, or your domain, your domain level language uh, code should not know how you're going to uh, deal with, uh, with code. So for us, roughly, this was like that. In a typical Symfony application, user interface is something you output to the browser. Uh, infrastructure is probably uh, database. In our application, Drupal was the one who was presenting it to the user, uh, and Magento was our infrastructure from where we were taking data. Yeah, it's another uh, view of, of this. Uh, Uncle Bob call it, calls this as a clean architecture. So basically, you always look outside in, so your entities should be implemented by kind of like use cases, then controllers and web, everything sits outside. So basically your framework, it's, uh, it's on the outer level and your application which is inside, which is displayed, uh, which is basically run through your framework, should not even know, well, other way around, your application should not know which framework is going to use it. Another view, hexagonal architecture, same way, your code is in the center, everything outside should be, uh, should be basically away. Uh, that's basically handled by ports and adapters. Uh, port is an interface, adapter is what in implements this. So in our example, we had a interface, Acme depot, depot locator, Magento adapter, uh, Magento adapter, uh, Magento depot locator. So this is a port, this is adapter. Why clean architecture? Your code is clean. It's less complex. It's smaller. It's decoupled. It's very easy to test. And you can plug it into any framework you want. I had a, a funny story from my own company. Uh, our colleagues working with Magento 2 decided to build a module, but they wanted to use PHP spec for that. David mentioned PHP spec. It's an awesome tool which lets you specify the code before you write it. So they built it within Magento and then realized well, everything is like nicely decoupled. So let's put it into separate repository so we can share it with other Magento projects. But then they realized that Okay, but we actually can take it and we can share it with anyone because the code has nothing specific to Magento. In Symfony World, when you in install some kind of bundles, they always have something which has no name, no bundle in the name. So that's usually the decoupled code sitting there and a bundle working as a bridge between Symfony framework and a decoupled code. A couple of books if you want to read. Clean Code, Clean Coder. And the most difficult one to read, at least for me, is the DDD by Eric Evans. Okay, so when to use DDD? Main, DDD become uh, emerged because people were trying to fight with complex domains and trying to approach them with our you know, traditional data-centric approaches was not working for them. So DDD requires some kind of like investment into domain, learning the language, learning the process, creating the process, uh, building, you know, making sure that your language doesn't uh, stays the same throughout the project. So it's it's perfect for big projects. It's, uh, it's perfect when you want to use object-oriented programming as well. It's not good when you want to build something small, when you, want to, when you want to prototype something, when you want to build some kind of like a REST API or if you want to build some crude application. Applying the domain-driven design principles to that, it's going to be very difficult. Although you can use CRUD and REST as a part of, uh, of the DDs, like 
one of the uh, patterns is to create like a command query uh, approach where you have one side which basically writes to the uh, uh, to the to the data to the database, and then you create a projection which you can read whenever you you want to display some results. So many many content management systems they do it. It's like it's like easy publish platform. It writes to the database, but at the same time it creates a projection in in solo. So when you want to fetch your results from search, it doesn't query database because it's slow. It looks in solo. So then for that you may you may you may want to use it. Okay. So now it's a less interesting example. Symphony with Drupal 7. So I'm going to guide you step by step what we did within a uh, few weeks. So first of all, we used the dependency injection component, excuse me, and the Symfony config component. Uh, dependency injection is a powerful way of managing um, dependencies in your project. So it's basically automating, um, automating building all the dependencies tree. It works well with interfaces because you can you can then plug and uh, play what 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 you wanna uh, what what you really need in your in your in your controller in your in your handler. Uh, Drupal 8 now uses dependency injection. So uh, yeah, is it readable? Hopefully, kernel. So we started building our kernel module. You know, every application needs to have a small kernel. Uh, we thought for a minute about extending the Symfony HTTP kernel, but as we were not going to use HTTP, so we decided to, to build a small one without them. Uh, so we created a container builder, which is basically a tool which builds all the dependencies. Yeah, so it basically, container builder compiles that and that's it. Nothing. So, because we wanted to have a con configuration written in a file, so two lines and we load configuration from parameters.yaml. In other two lines, we load services, uh, service definitions. Uh, configuration we load from YAML file because it's easier to, 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 to do it this way. Services, we, we use uh, XML files for that because they, they can be easily validated and then they can be easily um, read by PHP Storm and stuff like that and used out as an autocomplete. Uh, we also had some application extension which was uh, modifying parameters on the fly. Uh, so we had it to add compiler pass. Um, then we refactor our code a little bit, so we put a building a container into method. Um, it sounds unnecessary, but in the next step, we wanted to uh, use caching from the container. So in production, it doesn't really regenerate, uh, doesn't have to rebuild everything, it just used, compiles uh, uh, the whole com container tree and dumps it to the file. With an easy trick, it doesn't do on dev. So dev is much slower, but all the bootstrapping on the production is being cached and reused every time you, you're trying to access this. It's, the difference is microseconds, really, but if you have thousands of requests at the same time, not, although not in this example, but in the real life, it's basically mimicking what Symfony does but on a simpler scale. Our parameters.yaml, it basically had a database information, SOAP client, uh, authorization information, and some product hydrator configuration. Um, services XML, everybody loves XML. So the next step, the next component we used was console command. So Console command is a component which lets you basically create, uh, gives you all the infrastructure you need to uh, to, to run com uh, uh, 
command line commands from PHP. So in order to use the command, we had to have a, some kind of import handler, which was basically a simple, simple, up, uh, simple handler which takes a product importer, which is an interface. It's where you dump your products from somewhere. And product persister, it's where you output them. The idea was that we wanted to read uh, products from the uh, Magento API and save them to the, uh, to the XML file. Yeah, console command, typical Symfony com console command. Uh, yeah, you said we had to inject one um, service, so we had to override constructor. Uh, we had to set the name in configuration and then executing it. This is a good way to decouple your code. Don't dump all your code and logic into this file. Decouple it somewhere else. Then you can reuse it. Um, and app console, very minimalistic. Um, we just use container to get commands we've created and uh, register them and it's running. Two seconds. Okay, so we have a command, we have a, a dependency injection. Now we need to persist our projects, uh, products. And that was, uh, our first step was to write them to the XML file. Uh, we wanted to use uh, a Drupal build in XML import feature. Um, so it takes a file system, uh, file name where you want to dump it, and takes product list, uh, and then it basically dumps file and renders XML. Very simple. Yeah. So why we were writing XML? Um, fetching data from Magento was, uh, was quick, but then um, it basically, we wanted to separate this uh, in stages, and we also wanted to kind of simplify it for Drupal to, to, to merge it. Um, yeah. So that, that this way we would have a minimal impact on Magento site, which was, uh, we wanted to avoid like overloading it with lots of rec requests. So why it didn't work for us? Uh, it didn't work for us because, uh, for some reason, feed importer was very slow. It was very slow. And, uh, yeah, it, would, it could import 10,000 10, products in four and a half hours, which was way too slow for us. We were trying to work out Elysia Cron to, uh, to do some scheduling. Um, we... Um, it didn't work well. It was working, then it wasn't working, then it would work again. Same products would be added all over again for some reason. It was like, and it wasn't working, um, it wasn't stable enough for us, and it was like too fragile. And also it was resources hungry. hungry. It was like such a simple task, and we had to give Drupal like two gigabytes of RAM to do it. It's like, seriously? So our second approach was to write it to the database. And as we already have an interface, we can simply replace one uh, implementation with another. We, um, yeah, so that was easy win. Um, yeah, why writing to, writing to uh, database? Product structure, sorry, uh, data structure in Drupal is always the same. We didn't care about versions. We didn't care about most of those little features. We just wanted to update data every day at 6 a.m. in a pretty quick and efficient way. And it was done fast, 40,000 products in two minutes. It was a lot faster than uh, for Drupal. It's, I know there are ways to strip out the bootstrapping and uh, make it slower. To put you in perspective, we only had three uh, sprints to deliver the whole project, so we had to make some kind of decisions. In the end, we got a composer JSON like that. 
we didn't use doctrine, the full doctrine, we just used database abstraction layer. If we use doctrine, that would probably be a lot slower. We had to inject our container PHP into Drupal, so Drupal would know the, our dependency injection stack. Uh, it's a little, I, I think it's a hack. It's not a real solution, but it worked well. Uh, but thanks to that, we could have one configuration for the database, which was shared between our Symfony bits and uh, Drupal. Small change to settings.php. Um, and then we had to create a little module for depot locator. So this module would basically would call a service to locate the depot, which was basically calling a Magento API and display the data back to the user. So it's Drupal 7 using dependency injection to find the right service in, in, in the dependency injection tree. Uh, project folder structure, people often ask about that. So we have a public folder is where Drupal uh, lives. We had the features, we used Behat uh, for everything. Cron to have some cron jobs defined, bin for our uh, executables, app to have our configuration like in Symfony, specs in PHP spec for PHP spec, source, uh, tools that was chef to, uh, to manage uh, deployment. Vendor for Symphony components. We also had a Drush. So it worked pretty well. When we decided to move to Akia, that was the problem, but we solved it. Yeah, that's it for, seven, for Drupal 7 working with Symphony. What we've learned Drupal is a great CMS platform, uh, and We've never used Drupal before. We ended up uh, acquiring a company who was a Drupal uh, expert. Uh, it's very mature, very well, well documented, has an awesome community. Um, it may have some dated code, but it's changing. Carol is here, means that the, his talk is finished and I should hurry up. Symphony components. You can cherry pick what you want and use them for whatever you want. You don't really need to s download the whole Symfony framework to just create a simple mini application to run um, to build some kind of command line tools. Decoupled code, try it. And always use the best tool for the job. At once when I presented this presentation, I got into argument with a guy who said that, why did we kept using uh, Magento? We should import everything into, uh, into Drupal e-commerce. And I'm like, but if you count the budget, the time we had, and a customer's unwillingness for like any change in this mat matter, sometimes you can't, you know, you can't jump over some stuff. So choose the right tool knowing what, what, what you're dealing with. Questions? We had 150,000 products to be imported every day because the, the Magenta was the source of truth for products. So we had to have a fresh update every day coming from Magento. Mm -hmm. I don't know, we didn't think about it at the time. It kind of like, because we had a data in XML, it sounded like migrating, importing XML was a better idea. I know I don't like the idea that we're saving directly to the database, because that shouldn't be done this way. No, it shouldn't. But as I said, we only had three 
uh, sprints for that. And that was just a part of the job we had to deliver. So that, that was one of the things which you, you've done the way at it, as it is. We didn't have time to make it better or spend more time to, 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 to implement it in a better way. More questions? Okay. Thank you very much then.